and natural sciences. Um, my specialties are in evolution and ecology. I study ants, mostly in warm places like the Bahamas these days. Um, and that's about all I will say. Uh, is Betsy, are you on there? Uh, yes, I should be. All right. Yeah. There we go. Yep, hi, um, I'm Dr. Betsy Smith. I am an assistant professor of chemistry. So I study proteins really. Um, I teach general chemistry the first term. And so I am one of the first professors you would have here at Elmira. Um, I teach all of the all of the science students in their first term here. Um, and then I also teach upper class biochemistry. So most of uh, the science students end up taking that as well, regardless of what, what their major is. Um, it's required for medical school. It's required for many of our majors. So most people end up having me a couple times. And I also do a lot of term three traveling and things like that. So. Hello, everyone. I'm Krista Barzen Hansen. I'm also an assistant professor of chemistry, and I teach the second term of general chemistry, as well as upper division chemistry courses that involve instrumentation, as well as toxicology. But I also am involved with the environmental science program and teach the environmental science courses for that major as well. My research interests involve looking at contaminants in water sources. I guess I can go next. I was, I was looking at Lynn, trying to figure out if she wanted to go next, but uh, I'll go next. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Corey Filtz. Um, I'm the organic chemistry professor. So kind of like Dr. Smith was saying that you would have her all the first year. Um, if you're a science major, you will pretty much all have me um, the second year, um, I teach organic chemistry and medicinal chemistry, which is kind of my background. Um, but my research is more interested right now in looking at chemical sensors um, using microprocessors. So like Arduinos or Raspberry Pis um, or things like that, if you've heard about those. Um, I'm also the college's provost. So that's kind of my side job um, along with teaching. Um, and that's pretty much it. Hi, I'm Lynn Gilley. Um, I'm the pre-health professions advisor. I'm also a professor of biology, and I teach things like comparative anatomy, um, animal physiology, animal behavior, and for the first year students, the second of the general biology courses. And as pre-health professions advisor, I do get to know the students pretty well. Uh, so if anyone does have pre-health questions, I'm happy to answer those. Uh, in terms of research, I do behavioral ecology, and I look at population ecology of white-footed mice and do things out in the field. All right, back over to Dan, probably. All right, I think I have volume again. Great. Thank you. Um, so at this point, what I'm going to do is just kind of go through a little um, PowerPoint, I hope. I think this all works now. Um, and this will just give you a little bit of a, of a walkthrough of some of the things that, that we have to offer at Elmira College. Um, please let me know if this actually works. Does that look good? Yeah, it works. All right, excellent. Um, so the sciences at, at Elmira College, um, basically within the sciences, we've got five majors and then some concentrations within. Uh, we have biology, which you can choose to follow a general track, uh, which basically is a choose your own adventure. Um, we ensure that you you get some background in all the major fields, but um, you can really make it what you want it to be. Um, or you can follow some of the, the, the concentrations, as we call them, um, that allow you to ensure that, th that you're maybe achieving particular goals. So if you're planning on going to medical school or PA or, or veterinary school and so forth, medical biology might be the concentration you, you, you choose. 
it just basically picks out the courses that, that you should do for that, or ecology, evolution, behavior, or molecular and cell biology. Um, there's the clinical laboratory sciences, which has become quite large in the past two months. Uh, these are the people that do all of the uh, COVID testing and so forth that you hear about on the news these days. Um, and this has always been a field that few students know about coming in, um, but is a really important part of, of the medical profession. Um, whenever your physician tells you that you need to take some kind of test, blood or otherwise, um, all of that goes down to the laboratory scientists downstairs somewhere, normally in a hospital, to run those tests. Um, and so the students that graduate from our program end up immediately hired. There is an incredible, there was an incredible shortage before the COVID outbreak. Now it's, it's multiplied immensely. Um, we also have biochemistry, uh, chemistry, which again has some, some concentrations within med medicinal plant chemistry. Uh, if you're interested in um, bioprospecting perhaps, or perhaps the, the, um, um, marijuana industry, so forth, that might be in there. Um, professional chemistry, if you're going to go off and work at Corning and things like that. Um, and then chemistry for the health sciences. Um, many of our chemistry majors go on to medical school. Um, you don't have to be a biology major. Um, and chemistry for the health sciences just helps you choose a path towards that direction. Um, and then finally, environmental science, which is a new program here. It's only been around for a year now, um, which has a really interesting um, collection of courses that will um, put you off in a position where you can move immediately into those fields or off into graduate school in those fields. And Dr. Um, Bars and Hansen will talk about that later. Um, going through you know, our facilities, we're a small college, um, but I think we provide an absolutely excellent um, collection of, of labs and experiences for the students that, that come here. Um, we have state-of-the-art organic chemistry um, facilities uh, in the middle photograph there, which is wonderful. Um, Abby was a great student of ours. That's, that's her digging into the NMR. This is a, a very complicated piece of machinery, I think, nuclear magnetic resonance might be the, the name for it. Uh, it allows you to look at carbons and hydrogens and so forth and, and identify organic molecules. Um, Abby is now uh, at veterinary school at Cornell University. Um, in the lower left there, we have students working in the lab um, for an environmental science project. And on the right, we've got some students doing independent research using, um, I'm a biologist. What is it? Rotary evaporator. Okay, there we go. Rotor, rotovap. Sounds like Star Trek. Um, here we've got some labs from upstairs in the science building. This is this is the uh, animal physiology and um, general biology lab. And I believe in this photograph we actually have both courses running. Our courses are our labs are limited to to twenty students or so. Um, and so this lab is far larger than 20 students need. And in this photograph, you've got, I believe it's my general biology course um, in the foreground, and then Dr. Gilly's animal physiology. I think you can see Dr. Gilly over by the cabinets there in the, in the background. Um, and so there's a, a 3,000 level physiology course occurring um, and a, a 1,000 level general biology course occurring at the same time in this room. Um, but there's two faculty members in there. And as you can see, everybody's working quite hard. It's a lot of fun. Off to the right there in upper, we can see a couple of students doing a dissection of a frog. Um, that is a very interesting lab. Um, has to do with um, the effects of hormones on heartbeat and so forth. Um, here we've got images from the molecular biology lab. Um, so although I'm an ecologist and study evolution and things like that, um, I do a lot of, of molecular work as well, or at least my research students do. Um, in this room, we have uh, a gene sequencer, uh, PCRs, which are used for copying DNA. Um, 
gel imaging equipment. You can see a hood back there for using organic solvents and so forth. Um, and this lab we use for research and teaching as well. Um, that lab, my research students do quite a bit of isolation of DNA and we're trying to isolate different kinds of markers in the DNA to figure out where it came from, much like they're doing with the coronavirus right now, trying to figure out where it was first introduced, so forth. Um, that's what I do with my ants um, in the same kind of um, protocols. Uh, down below, you see a fluorescent microscope. This microscope is used to create images like these, um, particularly that one on the upper left. So that, that on the lower left, you see a needle entering into the embryo uh, of a, a zebrafish. At that point, we were injecting some fluorescent dyes which allows us to track the fates of particular cells. In the upper left, you can see those fluorescing cells telling us where um, that individual cell that we injected ended up um, proliferating into. Um, the middle image is a zebrafish that's gone through some teratogenic effects. Uh, in the lower right, there is a chicken embryo that uh, my class was working on in developmental biology. These are all from developmental and the upper right is a, a very common kind of analysis. This is odd for, for my work. We were, we were trying to figure out if we could isolate incredibly small differences in DNA um, in identifying things as low as 20 base pair differences using really, really thick agarose gels. Um, some of the other things that we do, uh, Betsy, do you want to talk about Octagon Fair and, and things like that? Sure. I think he just has this photo this photo on here, so he can have me looking like Ray from Star Trek. Um, Octagon Fair, this is one of the things we do with our clubs. So we have really two main, I guess we, we have an environmental science club or two now, right, Krista? Um, but we, we have a, a chemistry club that is very active, and we have um, a biology club that is pretty active as well. Um, both of them always interact um, at Octagon Fair, which is one of the big things we do on campus. A lot of people from the community, people's parents sometimes come. They eat a lot of clubs have booths. So one year, a few years ago, for reasons I don't remember, we decided to have a Star Wars theme and we got a bunch of Star Wars costumes and the students and faculty dressed up in Star Wars costumes. So um, that's me in the middle being Ray and one of the other faculty members being, I forget his name. I feel like a bad nerd, but um, <laughs> the bad guy from the new movie. Um, Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren, there you go. Um, and then the other the girl dressed up as an Ewok is a student from the class of 2017. Um, I believe she was a junior or senior at that time. She is now in graduate school at the University of Stony Brook. Um, uh, getting a PhD in chemistry. And then there are, obviously the other picture is graduation. Um, and so those are just two of our, I wanna say they were biology majors. Mallory might've been a biochem major. Um, majors from, I think also maybe 2017, 2018, something like that. Um, something else we wanna talk about a little bit is our, our courses in term three. Um, this is just a, a nice example. Dr. Smith and I, I taught this course last year, um, but this is pretty much what we do each term three when there's not a pandemic going on. Um, so this was uh, our field biology course. This is a mix of, of uh, non-majors and majors, so students outside of the sciences and students within the sciences taking this. And here we are at the beginning of the course. We spend a couple weeks in, in Elmira in upstate New York, learning about ecology. So here we are at um, Tacanic Falls in, in Ithaca, New York, on one of our many field trips. Um, but then a couple of weeks later, this is the same class uh, off in Hawaii. I believe this was our first day there. Um, and so the, the point of the, the, the class was to get an introduction to ecology, but also um, study specifically successional biology. Um, and in upstate New York, you can study how an old field turns into a forest. But if you go to Hawaii, you can study how a volcanic plain can turn into a tropical rainforest. Um, and so here we are wandering through a part of Hawaii on the northern coast that's a tropical rainforest. We stayed on this side of the island for a couple of weeks, or sorry, seven days while we were there. We stayed on, on the island for two weeks total. 
Um, here you can see us again at the Waimea um, Valley, so forth. Uh, we did some snorkeling, uh, investigated some beaches, very interesting sea urchin. Um, we also explored the tops of the volcanoes. Here we are near um, Mauna Kea, um, suffering from oxygen deprivation. And then here we are exploring the crater of, an, of um, Kilauea. And in this photo, I, I love it because it really summarizes the, the, the point of the course where we have absolute destruction of all life, as you see out in the, in the caldera, and then life coming back in where Dr. Smith is walking there where the plants are starting to grow. And this is the point of the course of studying how after you remove everything, how does life come back in? Um, here's some more photos from summer research. You know, one of the, the really, I think, great things about Elmira College is that we really involve our science students with um, our, our activities in the lab. And that is a huge advantage for when they try to move on into their next steps, whether it's graduate school or professional programs. Um, for years now, I've been taking groups of students down to the Bahamas during the summer to do research. Um, for many, many years, we did it on campus. Um, we're, this year, we're doing it on campus in a COVID-19 kind of way. Um, but each year, we have these programs that allow students to do that. But during the school year as well, we all pick up research students in our labs. Um, in my case, obviously, we can't go and collect ants on the beach during the middle of the term, during the winter, but we can analyze their DNA. And so that's what my students do or, or create new um, kinds of traps to catch them with on the 3D printer. Um, you can see it's, a, it's an incredible experience for those students that do make it down there, although they do complain a little bit because of the bugs, but it's awesome. Um, research on campus is, is great as well, and we do things all over the place, not just um, in the Caribbean. Um, and another large part of our research program is taking those students to conferences so they can present what they've done. That really is, is an important part of developing as a student and having important um, parts of your resume for application to further programs. Um, it's, it's always fun looking at these old pictures because I'm, you know, looking at this now going, oh, she's in medical school, she's a professor, you know, and it's, and it's really an incredible opportunity that um, when you're in a small place like Elmira College, the chance of you participating in a meaningful way in these kinds of experiences is really high. Um, and if you're in a school where there's 1,000 freshmen coming in and 400 of them are biology majors, or chemistry majors, um, it's a little bit more difficult to get the attention of the people that are, are working with you. Um, but we do pretty well with that. These final slides are, are simply a, a review of some of our recent graduates and what they ended up doing. This is Chelsea, she worked with me. I Sadly, I didn't include any pictures of her in this, but we went to Colorado, went into the Rocky Mountains and, and we're sampling ants at 13,000 feet. I've got great pictures of us both being quite purple from oxygen deprivation, trying to find ants in the tundra. Um, but she went to veterinary school at the University of Missouri. Um, Natalie Winters, who went to a Farm D program. Um, Heather Nelson, who you know, these two are actually interesting because they were both interested in pharmacy, and one went to pharmacy school, and the other one went into pharmaceuticals. Um, up at Upstate Medical. Uh, Abby Davenport, who is playing with the NMR, she's at Cornell University now in the, in the veterinary school. Kelly Gast, who actually recently came back to the college to give a, a talk to our students, um, describing her, her career as it's gone. She's been teaching at St. Bonaventure recently. Um, Buffalo School of Dentistry for Kelsey. So just a really wide wide range. Here's Emily and, and Christina. These two are, are fun. They, they were sisters that came a couple of years apart of each other. Emily um, ended up going to uh, SUNY Upstate and Christina went to LECOM, um, which is uh, the medical school that's opened up at Elmira College. Although she went to obviously earlier at Erie. And then Zach, um, 
who is currently at Georgetown University. We were supposed to actually have him in on one of these conversations today, but sadly he couldn't make it. Um, he's working with uh, infectious diseases, things like that um, at Georgetown. All right, so I'm gonna stop there and turn it over to the rest of you, if this works. Yeah, if you're just joining us, um, be sure to, um, in the top right corner, um, open the um, chat box and just your last name as it appears on your application so we can enter you in to win a, a gift card. So, um, you know, a little perk when you come to campus for summer orientation or, you know, as soon as we're allowed to have campus tours, you can get a hoodie on us for attending the session. So, um I wanted to, I know Dr. Smith, you, you answered this really well, but um, what is um, the structure like with our trimesters? How does that benefit our science students? What would a typical um, workload look like for a science student? Sure, so um, most of your science classes, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, Nolan was acting up, maybe, I don't know. Um, most of your science classes will be in our two long terms. So term one is the fall. And so it starts, you know, at the beginning of the year and it ends before Christmas break. Term two then starts right up right after Christmas break and goes till about mid-April. So we just finished that about a week and a half ago. Um, so that's where you'll take things like general chemistry, general biology, anatomy, you know, ecology, whatever. Well, actually not ecology, that's a bad example. Um, ecology is one of the rare ones that um, a lot of our term three travel trips count as upper level ecology classes. So I have gone to Alaska, the Bahamas and Hawaii and all of those were run as sort of two classes at once where we had non-majors, so students majoring in history or nursing or whatever, taking um, a 1000 level class and then the science students take a, I believe it's usually a 3000 level ecology class that counts towards the biology major. Um, so that's pretty cool. But aside from that, usually your term threes will be used spent taking non-science classes, taking your general education requirements, traveling, taking travel courses, either in the sciences or not. Um, so I guess our course load, usually students take three or four classes, like lecture classes. And then because you're science students, you would take usually two or three labs as well on top of that um, uh, in the long terms. And then you take one or two classes in the, in the short term three. So term three just started just now. This is our first week of term three and it's about five and a half weeks long. So it'll end right after Memorial Day. Um, and I think, I think what uh, maybe what no one was saying was um, I actually, love term three for its travel possibilities guys hush, sorry my cats are being loud um i love term three for its travel possibilities because when i was an undergrad i went to school just with two semesters and i really wanted to study abroad i took a lot of french and i thought it'd be really cool to go study abroad in france um and i basically was told i couldn't because if i didn't take organic chemistry in the right year or whatever I'd be off and I wouldn't be able to take it my chemistry major. Um, so having term three, I think is a, especially for science majors that often do have these very regimented majors where you kind of can't get out of sequence. And it's also very hard maybe to take organic chemistry in France or something like that. Um, I think term three is a great opportunity, a way to go experience another culture without really, you know, interrupting your, your classes. So I think, I think that's really great for our science students specifically. Perfect. And then I think um, we kind of touched on this earlier, but um, all the science students in freshman year, they start similar classes, almost the same identical schedule. So you'll get to come in with all of the same incoming freshmen and take the same uh, set of classes. Um, but maybe um, what about a student who comes in thinking they want to be a medical student? They're set on that. How common is it? I, I know Dr. Carey you briefly mentioned with the alum and what field and what graduate school they ended up going to, but how common is it for students to change career paths or um, look into something different over the four years? Dr. Gailey, do you wanna? Yeah. Sure, I can address that for sure. Um, I have very many students that come in who think, yes, I'm gonna be a doctor. And many of them do apply to medical school, but there are so many other things that you can end up doing and you just 
don't know until you explore it. So um, a good example, I had a student who had really no idea what they wanted to do. And so they had two different internships and they explored physical therapy and they did a second internship shadowing a physician assistant and being able to compare the two really helped them. And they became a physical therapist and they love it. And had they not explored, had they just stayed pre-med, they wouldn't have discovered that. Um, other students, they try their pharmacy internship. Um, Heather's a great example and decide, whoa, that's boring. I do not like it. And I really like the applied science part more. I, I really want to do research and get into the um, chemistry behind the drugs. So you, I think the internship makes a huge, huge difference. And as you go along, you have a lot of time to make up your mind. So sample, you never know what might pique your interest. And a lot of our students do end up um, with a minor in a field that's outside the sciences. And I'd actually recommend that, um, you know, minor in Spanish or women's studies or our new medical humanities minor. That way you can explore a wide variety of interests and that's really attractive to any of the healthcare professions. It shows that you just don't have just one interest. Usually our science majors are interested in a lot of things. Um, history minors, you name it. So there's plenty of time to get that broad experience and pick up maybe a second major or uh, an additional minor. And I know you hear admissions say this all the time, but if you wanted to play a sport in college, definitely pursue that. If you wanted to get into a theater production or get involved in one of our, like we have three dance clubs on campus, um, definitely get involved in those things as well. Because I think sometimes the most successful students are those who have a schedule that's has a structure, that they have events planned, so they're not just in lab 8 to 11 on a Tuesday and then they have the rest of their day free there. They have things to go to and things to be a part of. Um, what about the research program? So we have the summer research program, but I know students research throughout the school year. Uh, when can students get involved? Are those research positions competitive? I don't know who wants to take that one. I can take it. Okay. All right, there we go. Um, I mean, I think we're all going to give the same answer here, but um, so when can they get involved? Uh, pretty much as soon as they get on campus. I know Betsy has a couple, Dr. Smith has a couple freshman research students already this year. Um, and, and the thought behind that is this one, we don't have any graduate programs. So all of our research students are undergraduates. And obviously, if you start as a research student as a freshman, you can continue on as a sophomore, junior, and so forth. Um, and you can build up quite a big uh, uh, research profile. Um, the uh, one student on the last slide, Zach, uh, I don't know how many years of research he did with Dr. Care, but they got a paper or two, right? Um, We're working in our second right now. Yeah, uh, out, of, out of the research that he was able to do. so. Um, and that's one of the benefits of going to a small college is that um, you don't have to wait um, till you're an upperclassman and then essentially work under a graduate student. Um, you, you can start right away. Um, and we do have credit for research. So if you take a, a research course, you get a, a credit for it and you can continue to take that research credit for as long as you're at the college. Um, the, the school does support research, so um, if you publish your research or you're going to go to present your research, um, we do actually have funding that helps students go there. So I've taken students almost every year to the um, National American Chemical Society meeting. Um, this year, um, obviously, it was canceled uh, with the pandemic. Um, so we've gone everywhere from San Diego, Anaheim, Denver, Chicago, Dallas. Um, Orlando, just pretty much all over the map. This year was in Philly, so I wasn't too upset that I had to miss it, but um, that's a little close to home. 
but um, the college does support that. All right, and just a reminder, um, if you have any questions at all, um, now's a perfect time if you, um, up in that chat box, if you just want to uh, put a question to the faculty, um, we're going to provide you with their contact information. So after the event, um, you can reach out to them with any last minute questions. Um, as you know, we moved the enrollment deadline from May 1st to June 1st. Um, we know this is a, you know, it's always difficult to choose a college. And I think during this pandemic, it's it's become even more difficult because you can't come to campus and, and take an actual tour and see the science facility again. And, and most importantly, meet our students. So I know these faculty can say that all of their students would be willing to talk to you and, and tell you why this program is the one you should choose for the fall. Um, but do you guys have any like words of advice for a student maybe between us and one other school, and they seem very similar, but they're having trouble making that final choice. I don't know if Corey wants to take it, or Dr. Stiltz, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can take it. Um, so I think you you kind of started right there with the, um, ask another student. Um, you know, we're sitting here and marketing, obviously the college, but you know, the students will shoot you straight as far as you know, all the little stuff that maybe we're not thinking about because we haven't been students for a while um, that might interest you. How's the food? You know, what's dorm like? Our dorm life like? All those other questions that's going to be a part of your day that's not a part of our day. Um, and then when you're comparing schools, you know, compare uh, size. I would think would be the biggest um, thing to look at. You know, if you go to a, a state school, like let's say uh, close one is University of Buffalo, um, you're just gonna essentially be a number. Um, and I know that because I was in grad school there and you literally wrote the last four digits of your social security number instead of your name on the top of the exam. <laughs> so you were truly a number. Here, um, everybody's gonna know your name, especially if you're a science major, um, which has its good, good points and bad points. Um, so, like I say, uh, if you know, if you're going to skip my 10:30 class in the morning, I'm almost going to guarantee that I'm going to be behind you in the lunch line at you know 11:30, 12 o'clock, and that's fine. Um, but I'd also be able to say, hey, missed you in class. You okay? Is there something I can do for you? That type of stuff also comes with having a, a small campus, um, that camaraderie. Um, Along with the labs that we have, we also have a student lounge in the science building. I don't think we mentioned that, but um, the students enjoy that a lot. They use it for study sessions. They use it to kind of hang out if they have a half an hour or an hour between classes. Um, there's a pretty big support system in the, in the sciences as well as the other majors. So yeah, when you're looking for a college, it's those types of things. Everybody has a biology major. Everybody has a chemistry major. Um, it's these other small things that you might not be thinking about that you should be looking at. And yeah. like I said, you don't have to listen to us. You can listen to the students. In this in this time, it's actually really great because you know when we had this issue with COVID coming in and the classes got all disrupted. I knew all of my students intimately. I knew all of their problems. I knew when things were their fault and not. And because of that, we're, we're really able to reach out and kind of work with students in, in situations that may be, you know, not normal like this um, compared to a larger school that if you've got 300 people in your class and one of them doesn't submit assignments, are you going to pursue that or not? And so, you know, that that kind of personal relationship that we build with all of our students, I think really is worth something um, that's, that is worth pursuing. And I'm not sure how common uh, the junior seminar is, and I'm not sure if we mentioned that, but um, Dr. Gilly, do you wanna talk just about the last couple of years preparing our students for the, the next chapter? Sure, uh, the junior seminar I think is a really important step and it might not be something that every school would have. Our junior seminar, all the science students will take, and in that seminar, they produce their own web pages to highlight their accomplishments, but they also do a self-assessment to see how far they've come and what more they need to do to kind of finish up and pursue the career path that they want. 
We have a wonderful speaker series with um, professionals coming in, scientists, sometimes alums, and we love to hear stories of our alums. And, and they come in and they share how they got into science. And that helps the students kind of figure out which direction they're going. It also helps them, uh, because so many of them are in the pre-health professions, to decide uh, which schools to apply to, how to polish up their resume, and they take practice exams as well. We do mock interviews, uh, a lot of experiences that help them figure out the last few stages of their life at EC before they move on. And our students obviously go to graduate, every year I bet you hear a new graduate school that our students have selected, because I think you don't just look in upstate New York, students look all over, they look on the West Coast, but what are some of our big affiliates that um, students work with or can get accepted into it, I mean? Yes, I can definitely speak to the pre-health professions in particular, um, but our students go all over the country. Uh, we have many students that will um, go into healthcare in the Northeast because that might be where they're from, but we've sent students all over the country. Um, our major affiliates for our special programs for pre-health is something I should probably mention. So obviously we have our new medical school just a couple blocks away from campus, LECOM, um, Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. And we have a special agreement with LECOM where we can recommend students for early entry into medical school. And students can apply while they're still in high school. So it's really a great program. Not only could you apply if you want to go to medical school, but you can also apply if you want to go to dental school or pharmacy school. And we have reserved seats for all those programs. Um, if you do have any questions about those, make sure you reach out and I'm happy to help you um, kind of figure out those pathways. We also have agreements with Buffalo and Binghamton. Uh, with each of these programs, we have a three plus four for pharmacy. So students spend three years getting a biochemistry degree with us and then moving on to pharmacy school. Uh, we also have some special programs in podiatry, um, chiropractic, and you know, Dr. Kerr mentioned the clinical lab sciences. And those are typically three plus one programs where you have three years of coursework and then the one year at the affiliated hospital. And we're affiliated with uh, four or five different hospitals in the area and students get jobs right out of those programs. So each year we send students to every program you can think of, medical, pharmacy, vet, you know, PA school, you name it. So I think we do very well within uh, healthcare. We also have a, a lot of students that go into research. So students are pursuing PhD programs, master's programs in genetics, biochemistry, marine ecology. Again, it's really across the spectrum. I would also add that some of our students just go straight out of uh their bachelor's into a job. Um, and the only reason I say that, and I think Annie didn't pursue anything past undergraduate, did she, Dan? Annie good enough? No. So, and the only reason I bring her up is because I'm jealous of her job. Um, she graduated with her bachelor's and now she studies whales um, and just pretty much goes on, on a boat every day, monitors whales, looks at whales, counts whales, and she just posted earlier today on Facebook because we're friends. And it just makes me think, why did I go get my PhD? Uh, <laughs> so we, we do have students that go straight from undergrad on to, to, to cool and exciting jobs. I'm trying to think of the other student's name. She was just here when I started, who did the dolphin research with the Navy. Oh, Meredith. Meredith, yeah. Frost, yeah. Yeah, Meredith Frost. She went straight from undergrad to doing dolphin research, which in Florida with the Navy, which is pretty amazing. Oh, so we have a question here. Um, I know you guys talked about the usual year for science students, the, the junior year, I think, but how are the online classes going? Are they, are they difficult for students and for you guys? Like, how has that been adjusting, especially with the lab component? 
I think that's uh, all of it, right? Okay. <laughs> Um, I guess I can take that. I think, I mean, it's been a mixture, certainly. Um, we've all sort of handled it a little bit differently. Um, some of us taught sort of in the same time, you know, sort of online. I know I finished out biochemistry by having meetings at the same time where I went through a lecture um, because that seemed like that's what the students wanted. Um, and in other classes, people did a little bit more, here's the material, do it on your own time, ask me if you have questions. Um, it really just depended on the class. Um, I think the students handle, the stu from what I've heard, the students feel like we did a pretty good job of it. Um, I have not heard anyone really complaining. And I actually have friends who work at other institutions where they've heard students saying, oh, my professors aren't teaching anymore. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and our students are comfortable telling me things like this. I would have heard if there were professors who were not doing their classes, they would have told me. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was it's hard. I'm not, you know, obviously this has not been easy on anybody. Um, but I, I think like Dr. was Dr. Kerr, I think it was saying it helped a lot that we knew them already so well. Um, I have a friend who teaches at Albany and she has 300 people in her class and she doesn't know her students really at all. And she has really struggled with the online. And I was like, yeah, well, I have my 15 students in biochem. I mean, and, and I already knew how, who they were. I knew, I know exactly where they all are at this moment. I knew where they're from, you know, so I, I think that was very helpful in us being able to go online in an easy way. Fingers crossed, we won't have to do that in the fall, but <laughs> fingers crossed. I think there's, there's, there's basically two approaches that most faculty at Elmira have taken. One was the synchronous version that, that Dr. Smith was talking about where you try and maintain this idea of having a class at a given time um, and and do things like we're doing with uh, with Google Meets right here. Um, and I, I kind of anticipate like if a college, if we had to go to an online format for next year, many of us would default to this because we do have relatively small classes and this allows us to, to perform in that way that we're used to. Um, I went, when I finished up my biostats and general biology class last term, I went for the asynchronous where I recorded myself, you know, in a little corner of the screen talking over my, my presentation, um, which I don't necessarily like, but it allowed all of those students who had different circumstances because, you know, there were more students in, in at least that general biology class. So if they if they had other things they had to do, they were able to take part when they could. Um, and I, I I feel like mostly that's that, those are the two things. So if you end up going to any college next fall, it's going to be one of those two six circumstances where you just try and create the exact same situation you would have had going to college, or create an asynchronous situation. Um, how much if students like crossed, it. We'll have classes. So <laughs> yes. hopefully that's hopefully the I mean, well, I mean, one thing I would say. I have, I'm doing a combination in my term three class where normally we would have classes four times a week and for an hour and a half. And so, because term three is kind of sped up. Um, and so what I'm doing is like half an hour twice a week just to check in with them, make sure everybody's still on the right page, right? Um, but then most of the material is, as you said, sort of asynchronous. They can do it on their own time if they're watching their little sibling or they're working or something like that. So, yeah. And I wouldn't let um, the uncertainty of where things are going deter you from enrolling um, because you still want to start with your cohort of science students. Even if term one is online, you would still be in bio concepts one, intro to chemistry. And then if you waited a year or waited until the winter term to start any coursework, it may be difficult for you to find your, your groove and, and meet your cohort and everything um, here as a student. So I know some students were thinking of deferring a year until they know they could be on campus. But you know, with the uncertainty right now, I would say still kind of go towards that traditional trajectory of, of starting in the fall. Um, yeah, I would, I would especially say for science students starting in the winter is really not going to work well. There's a lot of classes that are, you know, you got to take both. So, um, I mean, differing year is a different situation. But, yeah, I, I would say unless, you know, I can't, so that's up to you, obviously. But um, it's hard 
I think to to take a year like that, depending on what you're doing. So. I do want to um, speak a little bit about environmental science. It's our new major in the sciences. Well, I'm not going to speak about it. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Barzan Hansen, um, and she can go into a little detail about that. Sure. And one one thing that I'd like to add with the online class format that we've been doing for the end of term two and all of term three is that a lot of the faculty, myself included, are very flexible and are willing to work with students because we have small class sizes when issues arise and really building and tailoring a class to the people that are actually enrolled. So I find that the online format has been helpful in order to tailor and construct a course specifically for those students. So regarding the environmental science major, it's one of my favorite programs here. And I'm super excited about being able to offer it. So people in the program get to take the first year of both chemistry and biology. So you'd be taking courses with all the science cohort in both chemistry and biology. And you would also be able to take more specialized classes in environmental science that your other science peers wouldn't necessarily be taking unless they wanted to take it as electives. So you get to take courses like geology, hydrology, climatology, learning about climate and how the atmosphere works, toxicology, and investigating how various pollutants interact with the human body, as well as an internship, which you've heard a little bit about, and geographic information systems, which is a mapping software, which is a highly marketable skill that you can use for getting a job right out of graduation from Elmira. And environmental science students also have the opportunity to travel during term three, and there are some upper level science electives that you can take as a travel course. And these students can also participate in research like any other science major can. Perfect. So I think in closing, um, if each one of you maybe wants to share a new hobby, a TV show you've been binge watching, a book you've read, just something you've been doing um, when you're not um, obviously grading papers and conducting labs remotely, um, and then also maybe just one piece of advice um, for a freshman as they enter. Um, in the fall. So maybe start with you, Dr. Bars and Hansen. Sure. I've taken to watching Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on Netflix, and I've also been reading a book that I have wanted to read for a while now called Exposure. It's about the DuPont water pollution crisis in West Virginia. And a piece of advice for people coming in is explore. Don't be afraid to try something new and meet new people and try new things because you may find something that you really enjoy. All right, what about you, Dr. Smith? Oh no, I was trying to, I'm trying to think of a piece of advice. Um, so yeah, during, during this whole shutdown, I have been, I have just finished watching um, Little Fires Everywhere on Hulu. So if you haven't watched that, highly recommend it. It just finished. Um, I've also been, I'm trying to start a garden. So this is probably gonna be an utter disaster because I don't really know anything about plants, but um, I'm trying to plant some like lettuce and carrots and things like that. Um, I guess my advice would be to, I know this is a really stressful time, but try to enjoy what you can do and be excited about starting college, even if it's under less than ideal situation, right? You're still starting college and it's gonna be awesome. and. I know it feels like we're gonna be stuck inside forever, but I'm confident we're not. So like, we will be back on campus, we will have classes and it's gonna be great. Great, what about you, Dr. Stiltz? All right, I guess I can share what I shared earlier at the two o'clock one. Um, this morning I built a mobile desk that attaches to my treadmill so I can do emails and walk at the same time. Um, I got to try it out a little bit, it's okay. Um, we'll see if I can do it for hours at a time. 
Um, book I'm reading, I am rereading probably for like the third time, The Lord of the Rings. Just to have to do it once every few years. Um, and then a bit of advice would be um, to remove some of your bias. I, and I'm only saying this because I have a daughter who just started um, her freshman year this year. And I don't know, maybe it's just her high school, but she was very biased about college, thinking it was going to be extremely difficult and so much worse than high school. And she's actually enjoyed it much more um, and finds it a little bit easier because she's very good at scheduling her time. Um, so just to remove a little bit of bias when you come there, um, make new friends. Um, my, my lifelong friends are from college. They're not from high school. I'll say that too. So, um, just enjoy yourself as, uh, Dr. Smith said, and focus on other things just in, uh, the, than classes, right? We have a lot of different groups. Um, there's a Harry Potter group I know on campus. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's probably my next reread for the fourth or fifth time um, after I get done with Lord of the Rings. All right, what about you, Dr. Gilly? Well, I've been rereading my Terry Pratchett collection um, and Good Omens, great book. They've turned it into a Amazon Prime series, which is also excellent, very funny. Um, as far as advice, um, yeah, I would, I would echo what the other faculty have said for sure to be excited about it. Uh, it's going to definitely be a very different end to high school and a very different beginning to college, but be excited about it. It will be great, a chance to explore new things and just roll with the punches. All right, Dr. Kerr, now that they stole all the good answers, um, all right. <laughs> oh, so that's a picture of your new dog, right? So that's the puppy I've been raising. Um, what else have I been doing? Oh, yes, here. Uh, Maybe hold it up to the camera again in case they didn't see it. Yeah, you got to hold up while you're talking, Dan, so they can see it. Oh, outside. yeah. So here's, here's one hobby that I've been working on, making bread. Let me find the puppy. There we go. There's the puppy. So cute. Yes. And of course, I've been reading old books about Napoleonic War. So, again, why is it we all read books we've already read when stuck in the house? Yeah. But no, and I, I would, I would really, what, Corey said, Dr. Stilt said about, you know, that experience in college, a lot of freshmen come in expecting some kind of high school experience done larger, done harder, something like that, but it's entirely different. Um, it really is, you know, it's, it's all about what you do when you're in college rather than what's being kind of thrown at you as is done in high school and so forth. And it's, it's a completely different experience. And, and one that you really don't want to miss out on. Um, I did take several years off before I started college and I, I, I don't regret it because I don't think I would have done very well if I had gone straight into college after high school, but I can see that, that the relationships were different because I was a, a little bit older than the students around me. And um, there really is something about that group of students coming together at that one time early in their 20s and, and late teens that that's really a, a great thing and, and worth the effort to put into it. So I hope I hope you all decide to join us next year. And then you'll get to see these lovely professors in person. So <laughs> that be in front of a classroom or in a lab and you'll get to know them as professors, but as you can see, they are there. They're not scary. You know, they will make you work hard over the four years, but they ultimately want you to succeed and have a successful career after Elmira. Um, but thank you so much for tuning in. Um, we'll stick around if you have any other questions. Um, if not, probably sometime tomorrow, we will email you guys uh, their contact information so that you can reach out. Um, and then like we said earlier, the deadline is June 1st to enroll at the college. So reach out to admissions, reach out to us, 
uh, the professors if you want to talk to a student. Um, we are here to help you. Um, and we're, I think, more available than usual because during this pandemic, we're more able to you know, pick up on technology and even do a Zoom chat one-on-one -on -one if you wanted to talk. Um, so just be sure to reach out. But um, yeah, thank you so much for attending the All Things Science live event. All right, perfect. Have a great night, guys. Yep.